Coming up on Network Africa. The police in Cameroon can find opposition leader Maurice Camto to his house following anti-government protests. President Mohamedou Buhari asks the international community to do more to eradicate poverty and terrorism. Plus, the Ethiopian parliament passes a resolution allowing for the country's postponed general election to be held within a year. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tenyo Lashoboale. We begin today in Cameroon, where opposition leader Maurice Camto has been confined to his house for planning Tuesday's anti-government protest. A video showing police vehicles outside the leader's house had been shared online. The leader of the Cameroon Renaissance uh, movement says that he was neither beaten or detained, but fears that he will be arrested if he steps out of his guarded house. Mr. Camto called for protests to demand an end to the Anglophone crisis and a reform of the electoral code. Meanwhile, at least one person has died in Cameroon's anti-government protests, which were held across the country on Tuesday. The opposition party alleged that the protesters were shot and killed by police in Douala. Many demonstrators were also injured and others arrested. Earlier, the government had warned of a firm response to the protests called by opposition leader Maurice Camto. The demonstrators were calling for an end to the Anglophone crisis and a reform of the electoral code. Mr. Camto says that if the two issues are not addressed, the protests will continue until President Paul Bia is forced from power. Mr. Bia has been in office since 1982. Now, outspoken Zimbabwean opposition figure Job Sikala has been released on bail a month after he was arrested in connection with anti-government protests. Mr. Sikala was arrested on August the 21st and charged with incitement to violence over the July 31st protest. However, he was released on bail on Tuesday uh, on bail for 50,000 Zimbabwean dollars and ordered to stop posting content online or in WhatsApp groups. Here in Nigeria, President Mohamed Buhari has asked the international community to do more to eradicate poverty, fight multinational crime and promote inclusion of African countries in world affairs. The president made the comment at the United Nations General Assembly in a pre-recorded speech to delegates. This year, due to COVID-19, no presidents or prime ministers are physically present in New York. Instead, their pre-recorded statements are broadcast in the General Assembly Hall. The international community will need to cooperate in addressing the scourge of poverty, particularly in developing countries. It is in this regard that we command the President of the 74th General Assembly for launching an alliance for poverty eradication in June. We encourage global leaders, particularly leaders from the global north, to support the alliance at this time when the coronavirus pandemic is reversing gains made in the achievement of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals and pushing an additional half a billion people into extreme poverty. Excellencies, the litany of sophisticated terrorist attacks across the globe is a harsh reality of the challenges the world is facing today. We must therefore redouble our efforts to ensure collective security. In Nigeria, we are still facing violent extremism from the insurgency of Boko Haram and bandits. We continue 
to count on our strong cooperation with United Nations counter-terrorism bodies and neighboring countries to overcome the terrorists in the Lake Chad Basin and the wider Sahel region. Nigeria remains steadfast in our commitment to the revitalization of Lake Chad. We are convinced that recharging the lake will improve the living conditions of our people in the area, promote interstate cooperation, strengthen community resilience, and assist in addressing environmental and security challenges threatening the region and its resources. Mr. President, as we urge and strive for inclusion within our societies, we must also ensure inclusion prevails in our collective action as members of the international community. Nigeria supports the expansion of the United Nations Security Council to reflect the diversity and dynamics of the 21st century. Africa deserves permanent seats in the United Nations Security Council. Nigeria's President Mohamedou Buhari speaking there. In East Africa, the Ethiopian parliament has passed a resolution allowing for the country's postponed general election to be held within the span of a year. The new Ethiopian year began on September 11, so the elections will be held before September next year. Parliament passed the resolution during an extraordinary session on Tuesday. One MP voted against the resolution and eight abstained. The country had postponed the elections due to the coronavirus pandemic. Now, Saturday, September 19 was World Cleanup Day, an annual global social action program aimed at combating global solid waste problem. It's coordinated by the Estonian organization. As part of activities to mark the day, the Swedish embassy here in Nigeria participated in group cleanup of Abuja Central District. Plugging is an eco-friendly exercise through which people pick up trash while jogging or brisk walking as a way to clean up litter and also also take care of their health. You may have noticed the Swedish ambassador to Nigeria, Carl Michael Granz, also plugging alongside others. Ambassador Granz joins us now from Abuja. Ambassador Carl Michael Granz, it's a pleasure to have you join us on Network Africa. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure. We see the Swedish embassy participated in a group cleanup exercise. You must have come across a lot of plastics, the major cause of floods as they clog drainages and are detrimental to animal life. The Nigerian government says over the next five years, it will have phased out plastics. How can we help speed up this process? Yes, that's right. Uh, you probably saw in our social media, uh, the exercise is called plogging and it was uh, invented, uh, you could say, in Sweden a couple of years ago. And it's really about uh, jogging, go jogging in the neighborhood and picking up trash and litter at the same time. Um, so combining exercise, physical exercise with uh, cleaning up the environment. And uh, it is true that we saw a lot of plastic. I was posted in Germany before coming to Nigeria, and uh, it was quite different, I think, the litter that I could see in Nigeria. Uh, in Germany, it was mostly cigarette uh, ends. Um, but here in Abuja, uh, there was a lot of uh, plastics. Uh, that's true. And, um, well, how can we speed it up? I mean, it's really um, a political responsibility. That's, that's for sure. But the idea behind plogging is that you can contribute and quite easily uh, just by going out and, and uh, exercising and picking up. But, uh, of course, uh, plugging is not, uh, cannot solve the problem. Uh, we have to find um, management systems for our waste uh, that are sustainable. And this is usually on a municipality level. Um, and um, also find uh, alternatives to plastics. Uh, we tend to use plastics a lot in our packages. And there are other materials that are less noxious. Like you sort of made reference to, you know, plastics are 
everywhere. It's a global problem. But why is it so difficult for the world to come together to deal with it? Well, um, of course, plastic is very convenient when being used. Uh, it's afterwards when it gets, uh, when it's thrown away that it gets uh, harmful to nature. Um, and you have probably seen the figures uh, by 2050, uh, more plastics are expected to be in our oceans than fish. Uh, so it's quite alarming, I think, and we, we really need to do something about it. And yeah. talking about management systems, um, I just learned that in Nigeria, about 20% of all waste, solid waste generated, uh, is collected, only 20% and even less, 10% are recycled. Now, if you look at Sweden, uh, about only 1% uh, of our waste from households uh, lend up, uh, end up in landfills. So it's being recycled, uh, turned into energy. Uh, there are different solutions uh, to this, but of course, uh, proper management systems is really crucial. Now, in some countries, uh, like uh, in more development countries, it's cheaper to produce new plastics yeah. than to recycle. So there is a negative economic incentive, and that has to be changed. Well, the focus this year is cigarette butts, which are highly polluting but often overlooked. Why should we be bothered about it? Well, because... Uh, People usually think that uh, cigarettes are just nicotine and, and paper, but uh, there are so many other materials in a cigarette. Uh, there is also a plastic, actually, uh, called cellulose acetate. Uh, and I think about uh, 150 other materials. You wouldn't think, uh, but that's the case. And these are very uh, harmful for nature. So uh, it also takes a, a lot of time for a cigarette to to decay in nature about 15 years. So it's, when you throw it away, uh, it, it lies around for almost 15 years. And uh, if you look at the amounts uh, globally, it's huge. About four and a half trillion cigarette ends are being thrown into nature. So this is really um, um, a polluter. The cigarette is a big polluter, even if it's small. Yeah. You know, just on final notes, now the whole world is focused on the COVID-19 pandemic, but in the move to clean up the world of solid waste, who should take the lead? Bearing in mind that this is also an important issue that's having diverse effect, uh, effects on people. That's true. Um, plogging is very much about individual uh, responsibility. And then we mentioned political responsibility. Uh, and I would say that there are different stakeholders here. Of course, policymakers, government, uh, municipalities have a big responsibility, but also producers, uh, the commercial producers, um, they are responsible for their product, not only when it's being used, sold and used, but also afterwards when it's thrown away or collected and recycled. So uh, this is called extended producer responsibility. They have to take responsibility of the entire chain. Um, so this is very important. And this is the question of uh, laws and regulations and corporate social responsibility. And then again, you have uh, the consumers. We're all consumers and uh, we have to think uh, about how we consume and how we uh, take care of our waste. All right, then, thanks once again, Ambassador Michael Grants, for your time on Network Africa. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to join. Thank you. Now, the head of the Africa Centers for Disease Control has praised African leaders for supporting a joint continental strategy to deal with the coronavirus pandemic. In an interview with the BBC, John Nkengasong says that public health initiatives on the continent, including increased testing, contact tracing and wearing of face masks, had led to a drop in new coronavirus cases. Earlier, the World Health Organization said the COVID-19 outbreak in Africa may have passed its peak. On Monday, it released fresh data that indicated 
Africa had reported a 12% drop in new virus cases. Still to come on the program. We'll meet the lone woman driving a motorbike taxi in the violence prone street of Eastern DRC. Stay with us. TV.com has more information on our top stories and others. Subscribe and watch channels, televisions, live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using your mobile device browser or download the Channels TV app for Android and iOS devices from their respective stores. You can also watch us via your smart TV platforms on Apple TV, Android TV, Fire TV, and Roku. Channels Television, ubiquitous. Thanks for staying with us. More on the COVID-19 pandemic now. Kenyan families can now play active roles in the burial of loved ones who have died from COVID-19 after the authorities relaxed restrictions. Previously, families watched from a distance as health officials in full protective gear took over burials. Health officials now say that bodies of COVID-19 victims do not transmit the virus. The World Health Organization and Africa CDC have not stated whether a corpse can and transmit COVID-19, but have updated burial protocols to allow families to give their loved ones a decent send-off. Under Kenya's revised measures, health officials will only be present in burials to guide the process and ensure safety. The authorities in Mozambique are considering closing beaches and tightening safety measures to limit the spread of the coronavirus. This comes after beachgoers were witnessed violating safety protocols on the first weekend since the beaches were reopened. Government spokesperson told journalists that people had failed to adhere to social distancing and wearing of face masks. He also says the authorities will monitor people's behaviour on the beaches in the coming long weekend to determine in the government's response. The country has so far confirmed more than 7,000 coronavirus cases and 45 deaths. And battles have been won in fighting the desert locust upsurge in East Africa, but the campaign is not over yet. In recent months, the Food and Agriculture Organization has been organizing uh, with its partners to control the current outbreak in East Africa, Southwest Asia and Yemen, while working to prevent new generations of locusts from causing further destruction to lives and livelihoods. We need to sustain the effort. I think the challenge in this part of the world is really to sustain the effort. We know that we will have most probably to continue until the beginning, uh, well into uh, uh, 2021, uh, while I think being able to scale up efforts, uh, for example, in a country like Yemen, which, is, which remains really a source of, uh, of desert locusts. We've been engaging with FAO and other partners just to contain the invasion. We have had one of the most serious invasions in 75 years, but uh, through the process of managing it together with partners, we have developed our own capacity to contain it. It's been nine months now since the beginning of the invasion, and uh, it's been long. We had hoped to finish the invasion maybe by July, but it seems to be going on and on and probably will be here for the next two, three months again. The FAO has developed a number of um, digital tools um, for countries to use in the field to collect that very necessary information, that data that's required um, to understand the current situation and then to plan and prioritize the control operations. 
In North Africa, an estimated 625,000 people have been affected by flooding in areas along the White Nile since July. That's according to a report released by the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Ocha said in its report that the humanitarian coordinator will allocate $10 million for the South Sudan Humanitarian Fund and explore a possible allocation from the UN Central Emergency Response Fund to help mitigate the effects of the floods. The majority of affected areas are still underwater, including airstrips, complicating the transport of humanitarian goods. Water, food and sanitation needs are at an emergency level in most parts of the flooded areas. You can see there is um, someone living here. Some of the youth live here close to the dike. So that now, a coalition of South African organizations have staged a march to the Nigerian High Commission in Pretoria, the capital city, to protest against a string of crimes allegedly committed by Nigerians in the country, which includes kidnapping, human and drug trafficking. They delivered a memorandum of demands, which was received by the Nigerian High Commissioner. He says that while Nigeria does not condone acts of criminality, even by its citizens, the country will not accept any any form of negative profiling because there are many Nigerians who are law-abiding and resident in South Africa. The mobilization for this protest began on social media and here we are at Church Square where people have gathered and they say the destination for the protest is the Nigerian High Commission here in Pretoria. Uh, the message, they say they're putting South Africa first and within that slogan are lots of messages that they have for the people concerned. We asked one of the leaders why single out Nigerians. The Nigerians are on top of the list when it comes to human trafficking, drugs and child abduction. That's why we have chosen that one. We're not saying like the others, they are not. But Nigerians so far, they are on top of our list. Nigeria doesn't complain about South Africans running amok in their country, but we do. So that's not a good relation. And it, it is a disgrace to good Nigerians because now you have all these bad ones who outnumber everyone else. The protest soon made its way to the Nigerian High Commission in Pretoria, where the Nigerian High Commissioner, Ambassador Kabir Bala, opted to attend to the protesters himself. One is from Uppington, the Northern Cape. Despite some strong words used by some, he listened patiently as several leaders gave the message they tried to pass across. Finally, on the program, Imelda Mambu has been driving a motorbike taxi in Beni in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo since her husband died 10 years ago. Locals say she is the lone woman driver in a region of almost 1 million people where insecurity has forced hundreds of thousands to flee their homes. Imelda Mambu weaves her motorcycle through the city of Beni in northeast Congo with a happy customer perched at the back. Once a farmer, it was the death of Mbambu's husband 10 years ago that forced her to find a new way to support her six children in a city where the majority of people live in extreme poverty on less than $2 a day. She sank her savings into a red motorbike known locally as a boda and hit the road. My husband died and left me with six children. I had nothing to do, so I decided to become a motorbike taxi driver to feed my family. The novelty of a woman riding a motorbike taxi has won Mbambu loyal clients and also saved her life. One time I was riding in from the countryside when I was ambushed by bandits at Kokola. They were dressed in red blood stained clothes and wanted to harm me. But when they noticed that I was a woman on a motorbike, they got very surprised and urged me to go on with my journey. Okay. Decades of unrest, including a civil war that ended in 2003 and an ongoing Islamist insurgency, has made violence against women commonplace in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. However, since launching her business, Mbambu has picked up a number of regulars, with many women preferring her services to take them to and from the market. 
And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenyo Lash Shaboali. Bye for now.